And on the day that we have our uh, fall festival out here, 29, there's going to be a lot of us singing. So if you want to sing that day, just have some stuff over here. And it's going to be between 11 and 3, I think we said. So be prepared to sing. <clears throat> All right. All right. Good morning, glad everybody. You know, I was hoping that. I was hoping for a full house this morning. Of course, I hope for a full house every time the doors are open. But I was really hoping for a, a good full house. But I was, I was looking for those male visitors this morning. I had this this message ready for ready to go for a long time, and I keep asking God now, no, now, no, you know. And, and finally, last night it was just, yep, that's the one. So I figured, I figured the house would be full. I was, I was like, wow. So this is for somebody. I'll go ahead and tell you, all right? This is for somebody because this was the day that the Lord has made, and this is his message. That is in it. So let me go ahead and ask the question. Any sports fans in here? <laughs> Just wondering because, uh, uh, there you go. I got one. I'm sorry, sis. This is all for you. Just come on up. We'll, just, we'll walk you through this step by step. And, no, I just, <clears throat> I tell you what, if you are a, Sports fan, this is the season for it, especially if you're into the, the college football stuff. Yesterday we learned that, that, what, a swarm of jackets can kill the small pups, the small bulldogs, you know. And, and the Commodores, they still rule over the big bulldogs. And uh, if you're a volunteer, don't play in the water because the tide will roll you over. We learned a lot, you know, yesterday by, by watching some football. And that stuff is watched Constantly. I mean, if you are if you are a fan of sports, man, this is the season for you. There was a song that came out years ago. It says, I am a friend of God. It's an awesome song. Well, this morning the message is called, I am a fan of God. Yeah. Whether you like sports or not, it can relate so much between your sports walk and your Christian walk. And this morning, I want to kind of get into some of that. We're going to use old Paul. I've been using him a lot lately. So we're going to use Paul as our example this morning on just what Paul had to do. Because if you look, sports. Now, we, we say here, we think, okay, this is, you know, of course, we call football. Well, we call football. Around the world, they call soccer, you know, football. And so, but around the world, people love the World Series. They love the Super Bowls. And especially here, but in other parts of the world. They also love all the college playoffs and all the football season. So we're going to talk about a lot of those this morning. And if you want to know just how popular the stuff is, Google, I, I, I'm going to let you all do this this morning. Go home and Google how much people normally spend on when they go to ball games, ticket price, everything else. And you will see just how true some diehard fans really are. Just how serious they can really be. But get to, get to think about it. We call that fan. Now a fan, when you go back and you break it up, is shortened for a part of the word fanatic. Are there any fans that are fanatics? The answer to that is yes. You can go out and watch them. You can see that there are. Let me tell you this. Here's the definition of fanatic. One who is unreasonably enthusiastic or overly zealous going beyond what is reasonable. Yeah. That is a fanatic. Well, they just, they take it past and over the edge. Whereas a fan is one who is enthusiastic about a sport, a pastime, or a performer. Now, you do get the fanatic fans. And you can tell them because usually they're painted up the color of their team that they love. Boy, they are. They're decked out from head to toe. They're sitting there screaming at you. Look at their car. You can't tell the color of their car or truck because of all the stickers and the flags flying on. There are some fans out there that you call them on the phone, sister. You call them on the phone and you get the recording. Don't you know the ball game's on? Call me back later. That's it. I got you. You can get these fans that are so diehard for their team. That if there is another team that is their rival, they just, oh, they just love it when the other team loses. Oh, I don't care that, that we barely eat to buy. I'm just glad that other team lost because I can't stand them. You know, if you're a fan of one, then that means you've got to be an anti-fan of the other one. That's just the way it works because you've got those rivals out there. <clears throat> There's a fine line. 
between hey, those of us Christians, though, and what if we took that same approach? What if we took the same approach, not necessarily going to where we hate and dislike the others, but where we promote God so much, to where we promote God and take it to the point to where everybody thinks, man, they are a fanatic. They are so, so in love with God. Look at what they do. Years ago, 1995, DC Talk came out with this song that was called Jesus Freak. I don't know if you've ever heard it or not. But some of the words are, it says, what will people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus freak? What will people do when they find out that it's true? I don't really care if they label me a Jesus freak. There ain't no disguising the truth. If you are a true fan, you're going to have their attire. You're going to be, like I say, you're going to be shouting it from the windows. You're going to get game days there, you know. You're going to be excited. If you are a true child of God, then you should be shouting it from the windows. You should be dressed in the attire that God would have. You should be as God would have you to be. There should be no nobody wondering. I wonder if they're truly a Christian or not. Everything that you portray should be pointing the way back to Christ, should be pointing the way back to God, to where everybody knows this person is truly in love with God. They're truly going to follow. They're truly going to they're truly going to do what it takes to make sure that they put God first. If we just had that same zeal as sports fans do, that same dedication. As sports fans do. Acts 26 and 20. Paul is sitting there talking. He's talking with King Agrippa and with Festus the governor. And they're sitting there saying, Paul, why in the world are you here? So Paul starts telling them, well, let me tell you my story. Let me tell you what happened to me. Let me tell you how I once was against what God, this new Christian, uh, Christian move. I once was against it. But all of a sudden, God struck me down. God talked to me. God touched my heart. God changed my life. And I become a true believer. I become a true fan. And from that point on, I fly his flag. From that point on, I walk where he wants me to walk. And from that day on, I carry his word instead of trying to kill those who carry his word. I'm the one that wants to go out and share what he has got for me. And he says in chapter 26, verse 20, But he showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, through all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, and that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for their repentance. But for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple, and they went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and to great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did. Uh, did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and he should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, and much learning doth make thee mad. He's sitting there telling, he's just pouring out his heart. Man, now they want to kill me. I understand what they think because their eyes haven't been opened. My eyes were blinded. My eyes were, my eyes were shut. And then God shut them literally and he performed a miracle in my life. So they don't understand what I'm trying to share with them. But I've got such a love in my heart. I've got now such a new attitude. I'm on fire for Jesus. I'm on fire for God. And when I work, the scriptures that Paul told me says, I don't care if it's to someone that's small. I don't care if it's to a person on the street. If it's to a homeless person. If it's to somebody I see standing in the food line. If it's to a worker that's over here. Or I don't care if it's to the governor, to the mayor, to the president, to somebody big, to somebody small. It doesn't matter because I want to tell them about God. I want to tell them what God has done for me and what God can do for them. Paul had truly turned. He was now the biggest fan that Jesus had, and he wanted to share the goodness with them. Anybody got Facebook? I know pretty much most of you do. You see something cool on Facebook? You think something that looks cool? What do you do? There's a little button that says share. Man, we're going to push that share button, and we'll share 
some of the dumbest stuff, don't we? I mean, you go back and you look and it's some cat climbing a tree or a squirrel running around. But we share it because, oh, that is so cool. I want everybody to enjoy what I just saw. But man, try to get us to share the Word of God somewhere. I'll let you see the Mission Impossible squirrel. But to tell you about a man who come on a mission that was impossible for anybody else, that he come down and gave his life, that he left heaven, to share that. Now, wait a minute. Paul, you are mad. All this learning has done made you mad. Paul's like, man, I ain't mad like you think. He said, my eyes have been opened. You know what mad means translated over to English? Excessive excitability, a persistent, obsessive enthusiasm. In other words, Paul got it so bad, he got Jesus so much in him, he got the Holy Ghost so much in him, that his enthusiasm just kept boiling over. He couldn't talk about anything else. He couldn't think about anything else. He couldn't sing about anything else. He had to go out and preach. And to teach, he had to take the word of God because it was so full, it couldn't quit but coming out. His enthusiasm, as they say, was uh, boiling and running over, and he had to share it. Paul says this. He said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. I ain't mad, I ain't crazy, I ain't lost it. I found it. Yes, I found him. And I'm telling you this, just like on the day of Pentecost. Oh, certainly these men are drunk on new wine. No. I'm telling you, I'm of my right mind. Yes. I'm not mad. I'm, yes. I'm not drunk. I got God. Yes. And I need to share God with you. So that's where that sports fan, that sports fan uh, mentality comes out. Because one thing about sports fans, they're faithful. If you've got your team so you've got your team. Don't let nobody, nobody going to talk you out of it. There ain't nobody going to sit there and try to get you changed here. Just, just fly this. Oh, I almost hate saying this in church. Dallas Cowboys. Just put it on you. Ooh, y'all forgive me. You know, I, that's America's team, I know, but not here in Georgia. You go ahead and you have your team. You can, you can, you're faithful. That's one thing people love. You know how come the you know how come new stadiums can be built? Because fans are faithful. You know how come you know how come the same team stay in the same city so long? Because fans are faithful. Man, they identify with their team. They put on the shirts. They put on the hats. Like I say, the flags hanging on the car. They put on the. Uh, they get tattoos. You know, anything and everything. You go in the house. You open up the cabinet. You know, or you go over to the China cabinet and there's the whole collection of Atlanta Falcons this, Atlanta Braves this, you know. It's all there in living color. The good China are going in that China cabinet. That's my team. That's the ones that I support. I represent them wherever I go. That's what Christians are supposed to do. Yes, represent Christ. Everything that we say, what we hand out, what we do, what we put in our storehouses, where we, what we put out there for folks to see. If it's not Christ, let's go back. What did Jesus tell them? A man can't serve two masters. Amen. He's got to either serve God or he's got to serve the world. Amen. So what shirt do you put on in the morning? When you get up and you're putting on that whole armor of God. Are you putting on that Christianity? Are you putting on what God's got for you? I tell you what, you, there are several things that can just be identified. Now, this is going to tell the truth to us here. There's this thing where everybody goes, Ooh. now either you're an FSU fan, which is where Deion Sanders come from when he brought it to the Braves, or you do that Braves tomahawk chop, right? But there's that other thing that here we go again, God forgive me for almost, you know, that gator chomp. You know, everybody knows that. When you start doing that, everybody knows what you're doing. It's just four things it's identified with. If you're watching a Packers game, you scan through the crowd, there's going to be folks up there with these big old pieces of cheese stuck on their head. You go to Washington Redskins, you're going to see 
big old men that don't visit the gym but the buffet line, how shall I say, every time, painted up as big as they can be painted up, and that's their part of their fan base. Man, the fans come out, they root on, and they show, and they are not, I repeat, not ashamed <laughs> to show themselves. They're not ashamed to go out there and support what they believe in. Yet you try to get a Christian to even say amen in church sometime. Well, back up. Yeah. Raise your hand. Go out to the restaurant. But are we going to pray over this or can we just know that we're all Christians and we don't need to bow? You know what I'm saying? Man, we, don't, we, we get so... Let the world... Yes. Let the world have more control over us. This is what Jesus says in Acts 1 and 8. He says, I'm going to give you the power. And then he says, you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Yes. But yet these, these fans here, they're faithful and they can't be conformed. What does God tell us? Be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that it's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Yes, amen, amen. Let God change you so that God comes from the inside out. Yes. That's when you're going to truly know that you have been changed. Number two, I'll run through these. Sports fans invest and spend their money and time to support. Yes. I already got into that a little bit. <clears throat> last year or two years ago, whatever, I think it was a real big thing. They even come out with these full size, you can get your favorite football player, full size, and stick it on your wall. I think they're called skins or something like that. You go look at the price tag of that, and you go to these people's houses, and you think, man, they spent thousands of dollars for supporting their team. They've got pictures over the wall, like I say, every hat that you can think of, and if it's got NFL branded on it, or, or if it's got SEC, or if it's got college or whatever, then I guarantee you or MLB, you paid a pretty penny. But that's okay. It was your penny to pay. It was all yours and you can support how you want. But you go out there and let a, let a preacher mention, it's time to take up our tithes and offering. Whew. All of a sudden fair weather fans disappear. So, wait a minute. We'll support Everything else. But it comes to, when it comes time to give back to what God tells us. Yeah. Ain't it funny how we all of a sudden don't have our money? Folks, I, I ain't talking to anybody here. I know that, you know. But if we can't, if we expect to be blessed, if we expect to have a winning attitude, then we have got to give back to God what is God's. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what will happen. If, let's say it always happens like this, the Braves, you know, they're building their new stadium. If they get to where nobody comes, you know, nobody's buying their tickets, what's going to happen? It doesn't matter if they built a new stadium or not. The stadium will be evacuated. They'll take the team and they'll, they'll take them somewhere else. Got to have money. You got to support it. It's a business. There is a thing called church business and God's business. Do we all think, does anybody think God could do it, but that these lights and this air and this heat and everything, no, you know, we all bring into the storehouse as God tells us. Now, when we bring in what God tells us, it is a miracle that God, he, he works, and everything is paid out and put the way it goes. But you try to tell somebody, wait a minute. You got your ties set up. I got it right here. All of a sudden, they get a phone call. Hey, you want to go down and see the game with me? Yeah, hold on. I got some money. Hold on. Let me go down here. You know? Next day, I come to church. You go through the offering plate. I owe you Jesus. And it goes right in. I'm not saying anybody here does that. But ain't it funny? And they, they really don't. Just so y'all know, I ain't never gotten to owe you. But... You know, it ain't me you owe anyways. It's God. It's God the one that tells us if you want to be blessed, give support. I say he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. And that God is able to make all grace abound. You know what abound is? Abound means to 
exceed even what you were, were expecting. Loyalty. Sports fans are loyal. You get a true you can tell a true sports fan because when you go to go to their closet or go to their house, unless they are a collector, they're not gonna have one or two of four different teams. It's gonna be all their team. There's a thing called a bandwagon, you know. Somebody gets on the bandwagon, bandwagon fans. Y'all know any of them? Boy, I know some of them. They used to bug me so bad. Oh, yeah, you only like them when they're winning. You only like them when they're doing good, you know. I, I just can't stand it. Boy, they, all of a sudden, boy, they've studied the books, know the stats. They know all about it. There's a thing called a bandwagon Christian, too. Oh, God, I'm at my lowest point. Oh, God, I, I've got the word. I just can't go no further. But if you will just bring me out of this, and if you will just get me, get me back on top, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship and follow you. Bandwagon. So another word for it is prison religion. You know, you, you got it when you need it. When you get out, all of a sudden, it ain't there no more. But a true fan is loyal. We used to go to the, to the Braves game back off in the late 70s, early 80s. And you could buy a ticket for wherever you wanted because there was tons of them. And next, you could walk, you could walk into the stadium, stadium with, oh, I don't know, whatever, 50, 60,000. That'd be, you know, 6,000 there. You could walk down the front row and just see it because them you know, seats weren't taken, you know. But it didn't matter. You're still loyal. didn't matter if things were going thin at the time. You still went and supported. Folks, let me tell you, as Christians, you're going to walk through trials. You're going to walk through droughts. You're going to walk through sad times and bad times. You're going to be like old poor, poor Elijah. You go, oh, I'm the only one that's left, God. I'm the only fan you got. I'm the only one that's still trusting in you. And meanwhile, God's laughing, looking over here and saying, no, you ain't. But sure, we sure think we are. You know, don't get to that point and jump off the bandwagon and go over here and say, let's see what this other team offers. Stay with God no matter what. Amen. Be loyal. Let me tell you what the outcome's going to be. Luke says this, well, what does it profit? A man if he gains the whole world and yet he loses his soul. Don't leave the home team. Don't leave God because you might be going through a time, through a quarter, through, a, through an inning or whatever where things might be going rough. It seems like everything that you're either fumbling, you're making an error, you can't catch, you can't pitch, you can't throw, you can't do anything right. But know this, at the end of the game, when the scorecard is pulled, if you are on God's side, you will be on the winning team. And in your house, in your, in your trophy case, is going to be what God has given for you for hanging on through the good times, for hanging on through the bad times, and for trusting and believing in him. You know Jesus himself, just so y'all know this, don't ever think that you're by yourself. Jesus himself was out there teaching and preaching. And man, he was going through it. And all of a sudden, everybody come up to him and of course the Pharisees start giving him a hard time and they keep sitting there and they're trying to, to uh, put him down, trying to catch him. And Jesus turns and as he's turning and talking, some of the men that were following him gets up and walks off. And then Jesus turns and he looks at his own twelve and he says, Are you guys going to leave me too? Are you guys going to desert me as well? And Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Who else has the words of eternal life? Amen. Folks, don't leave Jesus. Don't think the time's getting bad. It's time to change teams. It's time to change colors. Stick with God through the thick and thin. He's going to bless you. He's going to keep you. And you will walk with Him later on. In Acts it says, Peter said to the uh, other apostles and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. We got to stay with what God says. Stay with His life. Stay with His line. Then to go to what men have. Finish it up here. Sports fans are passionate. But one thing about it, boy, they get excited. Yeah. Man, they can get excited. They can scream and holler, hoot, yell. Yeah. They'll put it out there. I tell you what, there were a few teams, uh, we'll call them thug teams, you know, that we all know who they are. You can go to their cities, and I know people personally that would get season tickets to a 
let's just say, a San Diego Chargers game. But when that certain other team come to town, they would sell their tickets because these thugs that they were paying were so passionate that all they wanted to do was fight and cause problems. They had their own kind of passion. They, had, they put their emotions out there, but they didn't put them in the right place. We are supposed to be passionate about serving God. We're supposed to be passionate about where He takes us. We're supposed to be passionate about what He's done. For... <clears throat> Folks, think about what He's done. He has saved you from an eternal fire in hell. He has saved you for, for a better place called heaven. He has saved you so that you can one day walk with Him on the streets of glory. So that you can one day be with Him where you'll never have any more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. You're going to live in a place that He has made for you and His children and His followers. And if you can't be passionate about someone who has given you everything, someone who has given their own life to even save yours, then there's something wrong. If you can't see that that's the team that you need to follow, if that's not <clears throat> the one that you need to pour your passion into, Jesus tells us this in Matthew. He says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you've got enough passion about God, you've got enough passion about Jesus, guess what? That's where you're going to put your treasure. That's where you're going to invest your time. That's where you're going to invest your money. That's where you're going to invest your talents. That's where you're going to invest <clears throat> wanting other folks to come in. That's where you're going to try to win folks into God because you've got so much passion. You realize what He's done for you and you know what He can do for somebody else. And you want to pour it into them so that God can touch them. That's what Paul was doing. Here he is out there. He knew, and when you read through the, uh, this chapter, you know King Agrippa and, <clears throat> and Festus even said, if he had not appealed all the way to Caesar, we could let him go. Paul had the passion. Paul stated his case and had won his case, but because God was using him for something else, he had to go on. But Paul's Passion won his case over. Now, let's see what else Paul also almost got with this. <clears throat> Where did I go? Oh, yeah. Right here. It says, King Agrippa looked at him. And he says, Paul, Paul, almost, thou even, has persuaded me. You've won your case. I would set you free. I would turn you loose and let you go back. You've won that. But your passion, your drive, your enthusiasm has almost even won me over into being a Christian just as you are. Here is Paul in one whatever, 30 minute, an hour session so much enthusiasm, he almost wins over King Agrippa. We've got that much enthusiasm with us that we're just one little session with somebody, one little session for we are talking that we can win somebody over for Christ. Come to the instrument. Joshua tells us this. Brethren, fear the Lord. Serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you a big enough fan for Jesus? That you can win somebody over? Are you a big enough fan for Jesus that your life portrays Him so much that when people look, they see who you are, who He is, who he is to you right away? You know the way that you end up coming up with favorite teams goes back to your early childhood. I guess this is athletic, whatever. But it goes back to your early childhood. They said that most folks is either going to be they're going to choose who one of their parents liked. You know, if they like this team, then chances are you're going to like this team. Or, 
one of your best friends or somebody, somebody that had an influence on you in your life helped you without you even realizing it, make that decision on who was going to be your favorite team. There you know, that was it. Some of you was with somebody, they did something, they said something, they constantly watched, you know, on the TV. They caught, and that's why we choose who we chose. Our lives are the same way. Everybody around us is looking. Especially when we claim we're on God's team. We're going to support God while they start looking. Huh. How much memorabilia there does he have? How much fan support? How much is he invested? Does he have a shirt? Yeah, he's got the shirt. Does he put the time in? Does, does he go to the games every time the church is open, the stadium? Does he go to the and watch? Does he cheer on his team? And they watch it, they see. Are they truly fans? Or are they those old, old, old bandwagon, those old farewell fans? As long as they're doing good. God wants to know, are you his biggest fan? Think about it. Have you truly given to God everything that you've got? Do you fully support him? With every aspect of your life, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed all throughout the day, do you truly support God? Do you love Him with everything you got? Are you a die-hard fan? If not, let this be the morning that you make up your, your mind to serve and to worship a God who wants you to be on His team, who tells you, if you will, Serve me if you will trust me. One day, I'm going to take you to be with me forever. Bow your heads. Father.